Hey, yo, what's up, guys? Baby Bear 4812 coming at you one more time. Uh, we're doing the maximum product subarray problem today. This one's an extension of the maximum subarray problem. So if you're not familiar with that one, I'd urge you to go check it out. Uh, it's a bit easier than this one. I, I think it's one you guys can probably handle on your own. Um, I haven't made a video about it. I don't think that I will, but just know that it's out there. Uh, right now, it's being asked by Amazon, Google, and Facebook, Bloomberg as well. Uh, it, it's a decent problem, right? There are a couple of edge cases that we need to think about and, and how we work through them will will make for what I think is a pretty clever solution. So without further ado, uh, the problem essentially reads that we are given an integer array called nums and we need to find a contiguous subarray within an array containing at least one number which has the largest product. So it's not the sum, it's the largest product. Again, the, 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 the predecessor to this question is the largest sum. Uh, and contiguous basically means consecutive. So we, we it's not a, it, it's, you know, if, I'll show you the example. Uh, 2, 3, negative 2, and 4 would yield the largest product of 2 times 3. Um, if we, we, what we couldn't do was to say something like 2 times 3 times 4. So skip over the negative 2 because that would be non-contiguous. We have two non-adjacent uh, subarrays within this array. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about how to get the logic right on actually, on nailing this. Whereas here, uh, it says the result cannot be 2 because negative 2, negative 1 is not a subarray, a contiguous one. Uh, if our array was negative 2, 0, and, and 1, the best we could do is a, a product of 0. Uh, we could either get it by multiplying all three of them together, or just the two of these, or, or the two of these, or the 0 on its own. Um, but again, we'll talk about how to get there. So the, the problem itself is, is straightforward. I think the prompt is uh, the solution, not so much. So let's, let's have a look at... Uh, maybe we'll, we'll go through this this example we see here first and, and we'll talk about how to solve something like this. So if we if we think about some of the possible complications that may arise in this problem, or maybe let me put it this way, how would this problem become trivial? If we knew that we had all positive numbers, then we would know that the maximum result is just taking a product of all the numbers. No matter what we do, and, and these are integers, right? We're assuming they're integers, we're not dealing with decimals. Um, if we have integers all at a value of greater than or equal to 1, then no matter what I do, the more I multiply them, the bigger they're going to get. So that would be pretty trivial. Let's say I introduced the 0 into the mix. So maybe, let me do something like this. Let me let me say that I had a, a 0 here instead of the negative number. Now, all of a sudden, and, and we didn't have any negatives, okay? So let's pretend I just had positive numbers and zeros. Borderline trivial, what we could kind of do is, is we'd keep walking along and keep track of a product and, and every time we update that, that product, we'd, we compare it to like a, 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 a global variable or even a local one that's called max so far or result. And, and maybe we'd take one step at a time and realize, okay, we'd start with the number two, then I'd hit the number three, so I multiply the, the two by the three, so maybe, you know, two is my best so far that I can do here. Then I hit a six, um, okay, because two times three gives me six. Then if I get to the zero, all of a sudden I'm gonna get to zero. If I was to continue the subarray from the zero onwards, no matter what I do, my product is always going to be zero. So we can almost think of zero as being like a reset point. Okay, at the zero, anything before here stands as it is. If I want to potentially do any better, I've got to start from here onwards, okay? And again, I'm still simplifying the example here because we haven't introduced negative numbers yet. So if this was the case, I then I then go on and I say, okay, well, my new current product is now is now four. And I've reached the end, so maybe you know I, I kept, like I said, a, a max so far number, which was a six, and I, I'd end up returning what the, the best product was up till now. That's all fine and dandy. And, and again, that would look something like, again, I'd have maybe something like a current product uh, that I'm running with, and I'd have a, a max product, and I'd say something like, you know, the, the max product would be equal to the, the maximum of two values. One is our current max prod. I'm going to make sure not to write cover my, the writing with my face, and, and the other would be the current product we're at, okay? And, and, and this kind of just basic structure would, would actually just, it, it would take care of the solution for us. Now, as you may have noticed, things ain't all that easy in life sometimes, like right now, where we actually need to deal, I'll just erase it like this, where we actually need to deal with negative numbers. So it's really the negative numbers that make things interesting here. And here's the reason why. I got a negative two and I got a four. Visually, we're looking through this, I can, let's say I, I used a similar piece of logic and I said, you know, my product is two and then it's six and then whoop, it's negative 12. So now I've dipped down before what I used to and we may be tempted to think, okay, well, it's negative now, so let me keep on going and I'll, I'll, I'll keep on multiplying from the four onwards and whatever happened before is, is done and dusted. And that's fine, but what if I, you know, what if I introduced negative three here? 
Now, all of a sudden, our product, our, our trailing product, would be something like 2, 6, negative 12. Then if we were to reset it, like we did with the 0, we'd get 4, and, and, and then negative 3, or, or negative 12, maybe. We'd get negative 12 again. So that's no good. That doesn't help us for the reason that if I kept multiplying as I was, as I was going, I could get negative 48. And then after I multiply by, by negative 3, it would actually flip back to positive. So if I have an even number of negatives, they would actually make a, a positive product. And, um, oh boy, I'm going to butcher this, but this would be 144, right? So in this case, our maximum product is 144, even though at some step along the way, I may have dipped under. Question is, though, how do I know if I, if I dip under whether to keep going or not? Like, do I still have negative numbers in front of me? So one brute force way to do this is, is just to say, well, let me, you know, let me, uh, let me calculate every possible subarray. So I'll do all the subarrays of size one, two, three, and it, I'm sure you can come up with a solution like that, but that would obviously be, it would take too long, probably take too much space, and that's not really going to get us very far in an interview. What we can do is notice the following, is if we want to keep track of understanding when we dip below, kind of below zero and, and, and above zero, we, all we need to do is adjust our algorithm slightly, and what we're going to want to do is take into account what our lowest number is so far, as much as we're doing what our highest number is so far. When I say highest, I mean product. If I keep track of my lowest possible product so far, and I, I keep that stored, so when we had the, uh, maybe I, I shouldn't have, oh, I ended it. You know, I had the four here and I had the, the negative three. If I kept the maximum so far product, which would have been two and then six, and then I'd hit a negative 12, so maybe my, oh, that disappeared. Maybe my, the, the maximum that I had so far, so maybe I had a maximum and a min, these are kind of so far values. This would be six, and then this one would be now negative 12. And I'd, I'd multiply by the 4, and I'd get negative 48. And so that would update this to be negative 48. But now if I multiply by the negative 3, what happens? If I was to multiply the minimum number we had by the negative 3, we would get 144. And so all of a sudden, actually, that gives us a new maximum value. So what used to be our minimum most value can very quickly become our maximum. Maximum most, minimum most. Can be our, 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 so it's something that was once our minimum product can quickly become our maximum product if we were to multiply it by a negative, assuming the minimum was negative. And, and so all this to say, what we're going to do is we're actually going to structure uh, a simple algorithm like the one that I, I described earlier, but what we're gonna need to do is this, is we're going to need to keep track of our maximum so far and our minimum so far. So both of these values are important to us, okay? One and two. At every step along the way, I'm going to need to check a few things. For my maximum number, I'm going to need to make sure that it's equal to the maximum of the number that I'm looking at right now. So maybe I had a whole bunch of zeros before and I've, I've hit a big number. This is my, my best starting point. I find my maximum number. I compare that to whatever that number is times the maximum that I had so far. And I compare it to the minimum that I had so far. The reason I need to compare it to the minimum I had so far was for a scenario like we just described here. If I multiply by the minimum I had so far, that could become my maximum. And I don't know if it will, but it could, and I need to keep track of it. And in fact, we're actually going to use the exact same argument down here. And I'm, I'm just going to kind of do this to, to show that it's the same thing, because that, that product that we take could end up being the smallest value just the same. When we go through every number and we're iterating through it, we are, we're then going to just make sure to, to update our result as we go. And, and, you know, once we step out of this and we've, we've done this comparison at every step along the way, we're going to return the maximum product that we found. Let me know down below if that, if, if that answers, kind of if that logic makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, again, let me know and I'm, I'm happy to explain it further. I, I, I think we, we have just enough. The code is going to be short, so it, it won't be a long section from here on in. But let's, let's get that code down and see what it looks like and maybe that will clarify any questions you might have. So what I'm going to do is I'm, oh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, first thing I'm going to do is some is, is error checking. Then we're going to set up our variable, so the max, min, so far, and the result. We're going to loop through numbers, and then we're going to return the result. These are going to be our four basic steps. For the error checking, all I'm really going to look for is to say, if we get an empty array, we, are, we, can, just, we can return nothing. So if not nums, we're going to return zero. Next, we need to set up our variables. So, so the variables we said we'd have would be like a, a max so far, a min so far, and a result. Max so far, since 
So let's think about it this way. We, we're going to have at least a variable, uh, at least an array of length one, meaning that the maximum or the minimum we've seen is always going to be that first number. Where then, if there are more numbers in the array, we'll iterate through the rest of them and, and, and keep kind of we'll keep going and, and taking those products. But otherwise, that's going to be our, our default starting point. So uh, max so far is just going to be nums at zero. Uh, min so far is, is going to be the same thing. And quite frankly, result needs to be that as well. And the reason result needs to be the same value is because if we don't have any other numbers, we're just going to end up returning result and there's not, nothing to, to loop through. That first number is both our maximum and our minimum. Now, maybe I should say here through the rest of, of, of numbers. So let's think about the following now. I want to loop through everything that's not the first number. So I'll say something like for num in, let's call it nums from, from, from one onward. So I know technically I'm, I'm kind of creating a new array here. Um, what, what you could do is you can just say for i in range uh, one for the, the length of nums and maybe in an interview you can just mention this. I just, I want to keep the code looking a bit cleaner. So that's why I'm just saying for num in, in nums from, from one onwards. Um, but again, you can do away with this very easily. And what I want to say is this. I want to say something along the lines of the following. I want to say that the max so far is equal to the maximum of the number I'm looking at, the number times the maximum we've had so far, okay, as well as uh, the number times the minimum we've had so far. And that's because of what we discussed here with the, the negative number, right, potentially turning the min so far into the, the max so far. That's why we're going to check both of those. I'm also going to use the same logic for the, for the min so far. Um, only difference being is that this will now be a minimum instead of a maximum. Uh, the result at every step of the way we want to update, and we're going to say that the result is just going to be, since we're looking for the maximum product, it'll be the maximum of, of the result itself and, and the maximum product we found so far. There is one thing that we will need to that we will need to do here though, and it's a how do I put it? I, I put this code out here, I'm going to modify it slightly. Um, th there's a small tweak we need to make here. And, and the tweak is going to arrive because of the following item. If I compare my max so far, so at any given point, I'm going to calculate this number, okay? I'm gonna calculate my max so far, and notice that the max so far will depend on what that number itself was in the previous iteration, okay? So maybe if I was on iteration number four, I'm now on iteration number five, and that's what I'm gonna compare this number to. However, I'm then gonna use this number and use it in this calculation, the min so far. We're not really comparing apples to apples here, are we? Because what the min so far is doing is actually saying that we, we're gonna compare it to the max so far. Now of the sixth iteration, not the fifth, right? Not the one that I'd, I'd previously been doing. And so what I'm, what I'm going to want to do is I'm gonna to wanna to say, I'm gonna create a temp variable essentially. So I'll, I'll call it temp max so far um, is equal to this. Okay, so it's gonna be just a temporary value. Um, this way, what this will allow us to do is this will allow us to calculate the minimum so far on what the previous iteration was. And then this max so far is actually going to equal the, the temp max so far. So this temporary value that I saved. The reason I'm doing this again, I, I, I want to make sure this is clear, is because when I'm comparing, when I'm finding these two values, I want to calculate both of them uh, based on what my values were in my previous iteration. Now, when I calculate my max so far, but I sort a separate variable, it's not going to affect this calculation. The min so far will still be using the maximum I had of my previous iteration and updating it accordingly. Since I have this calculation done, I'm just going to assign it to my, my max so far here, and then we can use it appropriately in the comparison for a final result. And this should be it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to run this really quickly just to make sure I didn't make any mistakes, and, and let's submit it, make sure it works, and there we go. Um, so it was 65% here, it was 90-something on, on the previous runs that I did yesterday. The code's exactly the same. So that's about it. I, I, I think, I mean, this is, this is a good solution. It's a linear solution. It's linear, like I said, it's linear in time. And we can make it linear in space by just, you know, saying something like uh, maybe num is equal to nums of, of i. And then I'll just say i for range, uh, oh, for i in range one to the length of, of nums. And, and again, this will do the same thing. It'll save us on space so that we're actually, we're doing it in, let me make sure I'm not messing that up, constant space, yes. Because all we have is these three variables. Uh, constant space, linear time, your interviewer will love it. You're gonna get the job, just make sure to explain all the logic behind it. Like, comment, share, subscribe, all the good stuff. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching, peace.